Greetings, Fokers. It's Haley, and welcome back to another recap video. Now, this is posted on a little bit of an odd day, um, because I am in a different location right now. Uh, I am uh, in a different state recording this video because I'm with my mom and sisters right now. Uh, so that's why it's a bit off on the schedule, but the content is going to be the same. This is the out-of-town meetup that I went to right before I left for here. And as usual, there are some good moves and some bad moves. And you know, let's just get into it. So let's open up this review here and hop into the game. So first off, I matched up against Jim. The only other game I played against Jim previously was that one game where the people were spectating and like they touched my queen and moved it to g5 at some point. And we had to quit that game in the middle because it was running past time. So we don't have any results against each other yet. So let's see what happens. So I go e4 as one does and we get into a Vienna. This is my favorite opening when I against e4, e5, except for maybe the Ponziani. Um, and I play it because not a lot of people are prepared for it, but unfortunately, Jim was a little bit prepared for it because he played knight c6, and of course I play bishop c4 because I want him to play this so I can go into these sorts of lines. But after the game, he told me that he explicitly didn't play this because he knew about this line and how tricky it was for Black to prove anything in that line. So instead, he played Queen to G5, which has a very clear idea. And that idea is to attack the pawn on G2 and sort of constrain my options for development. But the funny thing is, I don't have to defend that pawn at all, because there is a ridiculous continuation here. If Black listens to the siren song and takes the pawn on g2, they are immediately losing after rook to g1. Because after the queen goes to h3, audience moment, there is a very forcing sacrifice that either wins a pawn and ruins the king's protection or straight up wins a queen. And if we're able to figure it out, the answer is bishop takes f7 check. And if the king takes, the knight hops forward with a fork on king and queen. And if the king doesn't take, then that you just attack the queen. The queen goes to h6, and then you just play d4, and the king can't castle. The bishop is just in here. You're striking at the center. You're completely winning. Like, how can you even complain here? But I didn't see that because I was like, knight f3, he's going to take g2. So I just play queen f3. I defend the pawn, and I threaten my own checkmate in two, right? So if he does nothing, then queen f7 and queen takes bishop is checkmate. So of course that he, he spotted that and played knight f6. So now we have just a normal chess position, you know? Now we have a normal position. d3, I attack the queen, right? So the queen moves. Then I develop the knight here because I did not very much like the idea of playing knight h3 because A, there's knight d4, which is going to be a very powerful move in a lot of circumstances in this game. But also I didn't really like, my knight didn't have any prospects from the square. But on g2... It could go here. It could possibly help with f4. It could possibly help with d4 at some point. It just has a lot more options. And I also prevent knight to d4. And by the way, the reason why knight to d4 in that position would be so powerful is because it hits the queen and it threatens c2. And if the queen goes back and defends c2, then queen takes g2 is super deadly because you can't even play queen f3 to defend the rook through the queen because the knight guards that square. So your best move is literally to lose the bishop. Your best move is to lose the bishop for this and then lose the rook. But the, black doesn't even have to take the bishop. Black can just take this, and if this, then black can take the knight, obviously. So it's just really bad. But uh, he didn't... Uh, I guess he maybe saw that, but... Yeah, a3, then takes. And again, taking with the knight is bad for what reason? Audience moment. Why is taking with the knight bad? What does that allow? We just talked about it. And if you're able to figure it out, it's knight d4 again. Threatening this, 
and this and this. So I play b takes c3, controlling his knight, and now I am a little bit better. Castles, castles. We both decide to castle. Apparently the computer wanted me to just start launching an attack towards his queen, which definitely makes sense because it is completely running out of space. Like if I play h4, h5 literally threatens to trap the queen on the spot. So he has to react to that. But I castle, you know, nothing wrong with that. D6, just opening up and possibly preparing to come down here. Bishop to B2. My goal is to is to play at some point this and try to fix my pawn structure and play in the center. But what I did forget um, is that this is a bit slow and he can just find some things to do, like including this Bishop E6 idea to try to open up the rook on my queen is something that he could do. Also, he could just go something like, uh, he could just like move a rook to the middle or just do something productive like that because even if I play this, he doesn't have to take, right? He doesn't have to take and he can play like knight a5 if my opponent's up here. So the, 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 the deal is he has lots of options to play against that. Bishop to g4 is played and queen e3. And then he takes. Um, not really sure why he did that. Um, the computer prefers this bishop e6 trying to open up the rook. I don't really know why he traded that because his bishop was pretty active. And now I am I have full license to play f4 at some point. And I also have the bishop pair. So if I find a way to open up this dark squared bishop, his position is going to be under a lot of pressure. Knight a5 just tries to hit that bishop and of course triple my pawns. But I'm not going to allow that. Instead, I'm just going to play this again, try to open up, and both of the bishops will be pointed towards his king. And at this point, he commented, he was like, man, I don't like the fact that your bishop said that this sucks. I'm going to go here to try to play knight f4. And in this position, I'm just like, yeah, d4. <laughs> d4, I'm trying to open up the bishops. If you play knight f4, I'm going to go queen f3. I'm, I'm going to go queen f3. That's, that's the idea. Because he was threatening mate on g2. So d4, and he plays a very strange move. He goes king h8. He just chooses this time to get out of this bishop's pin on that pawn so he could maybe play f5 himself, I guess. Takes, and knight f4, he throws in the intermezzo, and then takes back. And his knight is now fastened in by that pawn and he is ready to contest the open file so i i don't really have an advantage at all i mean you can argue that this knight is a little bit misplaced but in two moves it can reroute itself over here and possibly play some part in helping him open up on the king side c4 i'm trying to block out the knight while attempting to open up this pawn and i'm hitting this i opened up my bishop's attack on this knight c6 and I come up with a little fun trick here, which is bishop takes e5. Because if takes, then I take this. But what was better, apparently, was c5. Why? Absolutely no idea. This I don't really understand why this move is so powerful. The bishop takes e5, I guess. The idea is that there's knight takes g2! And now this is attacked, and there is a discovery threat on the king, so bishop g3 has to be played, and then there's knight h4 attacking the queen, exploiting the pin on the bishop because the pawn was taken, and when the queen moves to f4, there is this absolutely unholy move, knight e5! <laughs> This wasn't even an audience moment just because it's so ridiculous and hard to spot. The point is that if the queen takes, the knight hops in with a fork on king and queen. And if the, and, uh, right, if, let's say, um, right, so yeah, obviously this. And there's, like, other threats, right? So you have to deal with it because both knights are, are threatening that check square. So it's really bad. And the best move is f3 to stop the knight from taking that pawn and then you would go queen to sorry you would go queen to b6 and sort of continue the attack here with stuff like this as black but he takes the knight and i take so i'm up a pawn i'm like wow i'm a genius i won a pawn f6 defends the knight 
then rook f to d1, I just control the file. He goes here, and I go here just winning a tempo on his pawn. He plays b6. I feel like I'm doing pretty well at this point in time. And I play rook to b3 with the intention of scooping up around and going to g3 to attack the queen and just overall bring my forces over here. But what the computer wanted me to play here was rook to e1. Uh, again, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it was to bring the queen back and play f, uh, f4. Probably that was the idea, but I just didn't really see a reason to take this rook off of the open file. Rook b3, and I attack the queen, and it moves over, and that is a mistake. That is a mistake because I can take the pawn. And I didn't like this because the pawn would be pinned to the queen, but queen to d4 pins the knight to the king. It pins the knight to the king. And if it is defended, then f takes g6, h takes g6, and rook h3, and the attack continues on this king. But I go queen to g5, obviously just threatening checkmate one. He plays g6, takes, takes. I do this, and I invite an attack on my queen because I'm like, well, like I can just go here. I can just move out of the way. Like There's not really too much threat. Queen h4, right? I'm looking for maybe if this knight or queen ever moved to take here. Rook h5 attacks the queen, and now, now I exert this pin on the knight. And he's under a little bit of pressure because I'm just going to bring both of my rooks to the party to attack that knight. King to g8 gets out of the pin, which is really bad because of a sneaky little check. Audience moment. How can white check the king effectively in this position? There's a couple different ways, but this way does not involve trading the queens. And if you're able to figure it out, the answer is c5 check. This checks the king and activates the bishop fully along the light square diagonal, knight f7. And then the best move here was rook f3, just to put more pressure on the knight, to which black would have gone here, here and wreck the structure even more, but I play the catastrophic blunder, bishop d5, which just attacks the queen, and it's double guarded, so I thought, hey, how could this be a bad move? But it's actually a very bad move, because of rook takes bishop. It's a brilliancy, and I think you might be able to see the problem, because after queen takes, queen takes, rook takes, my back rank is weak to a checkmate. And I just completely didn't notice that. And neither did he. He played queen takes c5. I quickly exchanged the knights, checked, exchanged the rooks, and then checked here. This was a bit hurried. What I should have done after this was give this check and try to sneak in like this and team up. But what I did was I traded the queens. And the issue, as always, is my back rank. Um, he could, he can't really go here because then he blocks the rook and I'm actually able to take either one of these pawns. Uh, but if he plays this and I trade, he's winning. He's winning because it's a three on two over here. Oh so yeah, here we are back at this position. My computer had a few issues there. Um, but yeah, he's winning because he has a three on two over on the queen side. And he's, he's going to show me exactly how he plans to use that to win. F4, I'm trying to get my king active as quick as possible, but it's just too little too late, unfortunately. A5, he does do this a bit sloppily. King F2, king E6. And I should have played C4. I should have played the pawn to C4 because this halts a lot of progress over here. And if he tries to play here to shove the pawn through, then I can go here, right? And by the time this happens, I can go king here, completely sacrifice this pawn, and go king to D4. And I'm going to pick these up and then push my side pawn. So I have ways to fight back. But the way I do it in the game is king f3, a4. I go king e4, right? I take the opposition. b5, c3. Okay, so the reason why I went c3 was because I thought he was going to go here and try to create a passer on the a file. So I wanted to make sure that he can't play this. But in going c3... He can go here anyway. He can he can just do that anyway. Because after this, he can go b4. And I was like, yeah, I can't take with this pawn because he goes here. But what about this? 
the pawn gets through. But after c5, g4, he plays h6, and I think I'm winning. I am actually just drawing after king to d3 because I get to the pawns. So after king d3, he plays this, 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 I'm able to stop the pawn. But f5 takes, takes, king f6, and king here, I go the wrong way. I go to d5 instead of to d3. And by the way, d3 is still losing in this position um, because of king takes f5, and then he's going to walk down here and push this pawn. So, yeah, it's pretty complicated. But yeah, king d5, b4, here, 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 he pushes, and I resign. Oh, my God. He played that endgame pretty sloppily, um, but I just didn't convert. I, I, I just did not punish him for his mistakes, and I ended up underestimating a pawn breakthrough. Isn't that fantastic? So I officially had one loss against Jim going into this game, and we played another game, obviously in the tradition of these meetups, with swapped colors. So I thought I was able gonna gonna be able to break out my Karo Khan against him, but he plays d4. So I'm like, well, let's go into a Queen's Gambit maybe, but no, no. He, like Shane, the other guy that I've been teaching the Karo Khan at this meetup, he, like Shane, is a London player. <laughs> and I've mentioned this before, I do not like playing against the London because it is such a solid setup that no matter what you do against it, it's just going to be for naught. And I am like kind of messing up my opening already because I was thinking about that last game and I just like moved the pawn to e6 without even thinking. And then I was just like, wait, I shouldn't have done that. I should have played bishop f5 first. And it's not a blunder because the bishop can go to d7 very f happily, but I was just not even thinking because I was just distracted thinking about that last game. And I get into this position after bishop d6, bishop g3, castles, knight b to d2, and watch what happens here. c6. I just like the, the, everybody knows that against the London, you look for this kind of exchange to just open up on the center, play knight c6, rook e1, and occupy e5. Like, this is just basic stuff here. I don't know why I didn't do that. I just played c6. I played c6 to reinforce the pawn and play knight b to d7 at some point, but this pawn th th doesn't need to be reinforced because it's not under any form of attack at all. And he plays c3, and me, still being distracted, I'm like, okay. So I have a couple pieces over here that I need to develop. I could go here, but then this. I could go here, but then I can't go here. So I'm going to go here. I may play rook here and wrap the knight around. Do you see the problem with that? I'm not even going to make this an audience moment because I respect my viewers more than that. I trust that they would know why this is a blunder without me having to explain it but that just loses the bishop. And Jim did not see that. In, instead, he played queen c2. And I just kind of gasped when he played that. And he's like, what's wrong? And I was like, I just hung my bishop. And he's like, oh, well. Because like he's another one of these guys, like Ray, sort of, that just thinks that I'm like a really, really good chess player. Like all throughout the game, he's like, man, you're so good. Like, I don't even know how I'm winning right now. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess they just like, a lot of people like to just like hype me up at these meets. I don't know what it is about me. Um, Even when I'm playing badly, I just hang my bishop and he's like, you know what? Everyone makes those mistakes. Like you're still really good. I still have to try really hard against you. Queen c7, I protect my bishop, he castles long, and I play e5. And I was actually happy here if I forgot about this whole bishop thing, because I think I mentioned this before. In the London, as black, when you're playing against the London, you want to be able to play e5. And it's white's goal to try to prevent you from playing e5 and maybe put a knight there at some point. So if black gets to play e5, they are better, and the computer agrees. So I was happy, because I'm going to play e5, I'm fighting for the center, and then I might push here and just block off everything like here so he takes i take and we get an exchange and i just occupy the center so much more than he does i have more development and easy routes to become really active and he has to he has to take a while and he he messes it up even more by playing f5 
four. And the problem with this move is that it weakens this tremendously and it doesn't contribute to development. So I can just move back and then play rook e8, bishop c5, and knight g4 and just completely increase the pressure on that pawn. And that's actually exactly what I think, what I begin doing. Knight g f3, rook e8, rook e8 attacking the pawn, then bishop c5 attacking the pawn again. He goes knight to f1 and I play uh, bishop to g4. I'm really not sure why I played bishop there instead of knight here. But I think the reason is because I was afraid that he might be able to play this. But I just have, at the end of that line, I have queen takes f4. And I saw that. So I, I literally calculated that at some point. I don't remember exactly when, but I calculated that. I don't know why I played bishop to g4 instead. I Really don't know, because even if I get this takes, it's just going to open up the rook on my king. I don't know what I was thinking. Knight to e5. He is trying to instigate some trades, and I allow him to instigate the trades. And this actually blunders a drawing move here. Now, audience moment. What is a bishop sacrifice? Or I just completely ruined it. But what is a sacrifice? Pretend I didn't say that. What is a sacrifice that white can do to remove the defender of a piece? And if you were able to easily figure it out because I said bishop sacrifice, the answer is bishop takes f7, h7, sorry. And after knight takes, that deflects the defender away from this bishop and then this, and white just nets a pawn. Right? Um, but he did not see that and instead played and it takes g4, I took, and I was happy because I got another attacker on this pawn, and there's actually not a lot he can do to guard it. He goes bishop takes, and I was happy about this because, like, I'm threatening to play g6, and I'm still attacking this pawn, and this pawn is way more important than this pawn in my mind because it's a center pawn, and with that, this falls, and then the files start to open up around the king, so I thought that I would be doing pretty good if, if I won that pawn. So bishop to f5, attacking the knight, so I take takes, takes, and king b1. The computer wanted me to take with the bishop, which just felt a little bit unnatural to me because my knight was under attack. Like, what, like if the king moved, then what was I going to do? But apparently knight to f2, right? Knight to f2. Obviously, if the rook moves, then this is threatened, and d4 can be played just opening up. But yeah, bishop to f5, I take, take, and then he goes king b1. Bishop takes f4. I just pick up a pawn. He goes here. I trade and then back up because I'm going to place my bishop squarely on the f6 square, <laughs> squarely on the f6 square, and I'm going to be pointing over here, so I feel like I would just be, be pretty good there. h4, he's attacking my bishop, he's using what he has over here to try to create an attack, kudos to him, bishop f6, here, and... That does hang a pawn, but I didn't take it because I didn't see how I was going to guard this. But audience moment, what is a active move that I can play to guard that bishop? And if you're able to figure it out, the answer is queen to g3. Now you may have also seen g5, but this is not really that active. And it also weakens the f7 and g5 pawns. Like, this is a little bit unstable. And moves like queen here can be played, which immediately just put pressure on this, right? Because the bishop can't take because it's pinned to the king. So I didn't like g5 for that reason. Um, but I didn't, I did not at all find queen to g3. Like, I, I saw this, this, g5, queen c1, but I did not see that I could play this. Oh, well, you live, you learn. I go queen f4. I go queen f4 because if this, I maybe could even sacrifice or if he pushes and then I like go here or something, then I could take that pawn at some point. Like that pawn will be weak. h5, he starts going for it and I play bishop to g5 just to blockade everything over here. The computer wanted me to go bishop h4 just attacking the rook and if the rook comes over and attacks me, then rook e8 then rook e8 is super uh, sneaky because you can't take, right? You can't take because the double attack of with these pieces. Bishop g5, 
queen to d3. I'm not sure exactly what he's trying to do with queen to d3. I was thinking about a number of moves in this position. I was thinking about queen f2. I was thinking about like g6, maybe bishop h4, maybe b5, maybe c5, c4. I was thinking about a ton of different options, but I eventually decided to go with queen to c4 to get a queen trade and activate the rook and bishop on that same square to maybe lead to an infiltration. But after the this, the best move is queen to g3, just, you know, locating over here. But queen at c2 is played, which after d4, because, you know, I'm trying to open up and maybe get a queen trade and take with the rook and just activate everything. He goes rook to e4, which is a noble attempt at pinning the pawn to my queen. But audience moment, how can I attack the king in a way that he cannot defend? How can I force a checkmate eventually? And if you're able to figure it out, the answer is queen to f1 check. And notice how the bishop and queen team up on that square. So the queen can't block or else it's mate. So the only way to delay mate is here and here. And I saw that, of course, because I played it and he resigned. So I'm one and one against Jim. Good news. I don't have a losing record against Jim, but bad news. I moved on to play an opponent that I think was a better player than Jim. <laughs> and that will be reflected in this game. So I start off with e4. He plays the Sicilian. And right away we get into some Sicilian theory. Knight f3, d6, d4, c takes, knight takes d4. Knight f6, knight c3, g6, bishop b3, bishop g7, f3, castles, right? This is all theory. This has all been played millions of times. Like, literally millions. This is one of the most well-known variations, especially at beginner and intermediate level in the Sicilian. I even taught my uncle this line uh, a couple weeks ago because it's so powerful for beginners, the dragon Sicilian, right? <laughs> and the way I like to play against the dragon Sicilian is the way a lot of grandmasters like to play against it is to get this wedge here with f3, e4 to develop both the knights, the bishop on e3, queen d2, and long castle. But unfortunately, I mixed up, I mixed it up a little bit. I, 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 the move is queen to d2. Like, this is the main line move. Queen d2 here, because because you want to try to trade on h6. That's the idea. And then castles. And then black has a number of different things that they could try. But bishop to e2, knight c6, and then I play queen to d2, and we transpose back into the main line theory. And the most testing move, I was very impressed that he knew this. And right away, right after he played this move, I knew that I was dealing with a very good player. He plays the cutting edge modern theory best move, d5. Now, this move just basically strikes white exactly where it hurts. This pawn wedge right here, this pawn chain, is the power of white's position because it blocks this knight, which therefore blocks the bishop from getting activated. But if black can activate this knight, then that activates all of their pieces towards my center. So I have to be very careful. And I can't just go here because the knight is on c6. Like if d5 had been played when the knight was on b8, I could just push and then maybe play f4, right? Um, but d5 right away is very testing. And actually, it's it's bad for white to take because knight takes d5, knight d5, queen d5, c4, right? Then black can play queen to d8. And the bishop, queen, and knight are active, and this rook will come to join the fray. And then maybe bishop to b7 will fianchetto over here. So... Right away, after getting hit with d5, I messed up because nobody, and I mean nobody, at my rating online plays this against me. Nobody plays d5. This is what the grandmasters play. This has only really been studied in like the past 10 years, this d5 move. This is like so modern. I'm very impressed that he knows this. But takes, knight takes, this is the best response for black, just opening everything up. Knight takes c6. And then I castle. I get my prep very mixed up here because I'm already losing on the spot after bishop takes c3. I can't take with the queen, yes. But you're like, well, Haley, you should take with the pawn. Audience moment. Find a move that threatens a massive attack on white's king. 
that tries to exploit a line that opened up by this pawn capture. And if you're able to figure it out, the answer is queen a5. Double attacking this, threatening to come down here and threatening to come down here, possibly with a checkmate. There's just way too many things for white to deal with and they're completely losing. But e6 is played. This is apparently the limit of my opponent's theoretical knowledge. I exchange because I didn't like that that piece is in the middle. His bishop is still quite active, but I do block his queen's lines, and these pawns I thought were a bit overextended. Also, his bishop and rooks are kind of awkwardly placed and not really well developed, so I kind of felt like I had a fighting chance here. Bishop to d4. The goal of this is to obviously trade and dominate the dark squares, but there is a critical flaw to this plan, and it is that after takes takes, he has a move that forks two very important pieces in my position. Audience moment find a forking move that he can play that for that forks to both vulnerable pieces. And if we're able to figure it out, it's queen to g5 check, hitting the king and this pawn. And if the queen blocks, then this comes, right? Queen takes g2 and everything is pressured. I, I, I played queen d2 because after f4, I thought that this and this would both be hit, but bishop to d3 would just be the response there. But queen to d2, he plays queen g2, and I go here, queen f2. His queen is just sticking around here. He's going to play rook e8 and, ex and ex uh, exert extra pressure on that bishop, and I'm in trouble. Like, I am already deeply in trouble because I did not... Like, his opening knowledge was better than mine, and that is not something that usually happens. So what I did after this game was I studied that line with that, that D5 line, and now I know the best way to go against it for when I play him next or when I play someone who knows this line next. So H4, I figure the only thing that I can do is try to attack this hook here and activate my pieces to maybe try to checkmate on H7 or something. Rook to b8, this is just a very calm move, just activating towards my king. I continue with my attack. He plays bishop to f5, using the pawn while it still can be used as an anchor to activate his bishop. And also, if I take, he might even take back with the bishop instead of opening up the h-file. So instead of allowing that, I play h6. And my goal here is to go queen c3 and maybe look for a lolly checkmate on queen on g7, which is what that's called, by the way. When a queen checkmates a king in a square like this, guarded by a pawn, it's called the lolly mate. I don't know why it's called that. But instead, after rook f to e8, I go rook e1. And you may be like, well, Haley, didn't you say your idea was to go here and lolly mate? Well, he has a very, very unfortunate defense against that. Audience moment, how can he guard against that threat using the least value piece possible. And if you're able to figure it out, the very simple answer is d4. And the bishop is still under threat. So I would have to play something like queen to c5, but he just takes here, he activates, everything is just pointing at my king and it's literally imminent mate. Like he just placed his pieces so perfectly to help with this attack. So instead of playing queen c3, I play this because I saw d4. I defended my bishop. Then he goes here. And I played b3 because uh, I didn't like the fact that if I played some random move, he would be able to take and then take on b2. I was trying to avoid that. So I played b3. He took, I took, and then he went here because he's trying to double up. Bishop to d3. This trade is good for me because I activate my king closer to the middle. And his king is still kind of controlled by this pawn on h6, so that's kind of a boon for my position. Rook b to e8, trade. And then I go here because I want to sneak around and hit the a4 pawn. But oh, I missed another interesting idea by him here, which is g5. And if I go and hunt this pawn down, then he just takes on h6. He just takes on h6, and if I take on a7, then he's going to go rook h3. And if I guard the pawn, he's going to play g4. And I'm just completely losing. But instead, he goes uh, after rook to b4. I don't even attack this pawn because I'm like, huh, sometimes this gets the better of me, where I see a good move. And I try to find better. I'm like, well, here, and if I can get this, it's checkmate because he can't go down. But then he took on h6, and I was like, oh, my God, Haley, you absolute moron. 
Oh, so I just kind of went rook b7. He attacked this. I defended. Then he started pushing here. He doesn't even care about this. Because after I take this, he just pushes. King f2, g4. That that's that's bad news. That's that's bad news bears right there. Like I cannot guard that pawn. F5 here, he pushes. I go here, but the game is still not over yet. Because after king e6, takes takes. Rook to d2. Remember, the defensive rook is best placed on the second rank. Usually, king e5 is just getting his king more active, and I'm like, the only thing I have is to push this pawn, because he can't scoop around over here, and he can't protect this way, so he's going to have to like run down here to go here. d4, b5. Here, a4. I've just, I've got my pawns protected, right? So I at least have a mild prayer of winning. King c5. I protect the pawn, right? While still keeping the rook on the back rank and defending against any nonsense like this. Rook c3! Rook c3 is maybe looking for this and a rook trip, but he completely loses because of pawn to b6, which is what I play, and he can't... He's too slow to stop, to stop the pawn. And if he goes here to try to scoop around here, here, or rook here, then I just promote and trade off. And you in the game that happened, and after rookie, I played a5. And then I played here because I didn't like, right? If this happened, boom. Oh my god, why can't I do that today? I just can't click at all. Um, let's just delete that move. After this, here, here. I didn't like how powerful his pawns still were, but that's just completely nonsensical because here, here. If he goes here, I push. And if my pawn gets far enough, I can sacrifice the rook for this pawn and make another queen and then pick these pawns off. I just was kind of wary about how many pawns he still had, which is why I didn't go for that. And that ended up costing me because rook e8, a5, and then I go a6, which allows him to check and trade the rooks. And we both make queens. So now it's a draw. But I have the tempo. It's my move. So I go queen a7. So my goal basically here was to try to maybe force him into a way where I could skewer his king and queen. But I knew he was too good for that. Or just promote another queen in off tempo, right? Queen to d7. I take a pawn because I'm like, well, he can't check me here. And if he checks me here, I'm going to go here and run to h4. Which is exactly, right? Which is exactly what happens then he pushes and right now i have to start giving checks or i have to push but i can't now because his queen guards that square that's really sneaky so i was like well how can i promote this pun but also get this queen out of here oh i know queen takes g4 Does take takes he promotes and i promote you see a problem with that my pawn is on a6, not a7. See, we were both at low time. So at this position, when I calculated trading the queens, I just looked briefly over at this side of the board because my eyes were mostly over here. So I looked briefly over at this side of the board and the, the pawn was, can you over the board? It's not always perfect piece placement. The pawn was a little bit like on the edge of the a6 square. So I looked over briefly at that side of the board. I was like, okay, I've got a pawn on a7 so I can trade queens and we both promote and it's a draw, but no, the pawn was on a6 and I resigned. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting way to lose a game. And it kind of shows you that piece placement all over the board, is, especially in low time scenarios where your brain doesn't have enough time to process, it's important. Um, and then we move into this last game, which is another game that I played against this same guy who was very good. E4, C6, and I wanted to see how he played against the good old Karakhan. D4, D5, E5, and C5. I hit him with the Bavinic Karl's defense, or the beginner Karakhan, which is um, just the simpler variation that all beginners are taught to play. C6, and now there's two commonly accepted moves to be played here by Black. First is takes, and then knight C6. But you could also just play knight c6, and after takes, then you take on e5. This, these are like the acceptable ways to play. So I play knight c6. This is just what I prefer here. And I get the queen out. I'm like, 
at the, I don't know what was happening with my openings in this me because I you have to play bishop f5, right? Bishop f5, e6, and then you could maybe go for queen b6 or c takes and then queen b6. But if you play queen b6 here, then takes and takes, right? And your queen is kind of just left out to dry here. Because after bishop to e3, the bishops cut out a significant number of squares for that queen to be able to retreat to. And after queen f5, which is the only safe square, b4 just further harasses the queen. It has to go back to c7, and then the queen just takes on d5, and I just lose a pawn. So, like, I just massively, massively forked up my opening in the first six moves of the game. That's how, like, shook I was about these the, the games that I played before this. So, queen f5, he doesn't go before, instead he plays knight f3. So, I just quickly get the bishop out. Uh, b4 is still a good move, by the way, because of this. And he plays castles, I go e6, he plays knight b to d2. So he's just completely ignoring this b4 idea, because maybe he thinks I can sacrifice or something, I don't know. Queen to c7, I just retreat and double attack the pawn. But the best move is still b4. Look at this. Because after knight takes, knight e5, queen e5, queen a4. And the king is way too open. King to d8. Bishop b6 check because of the pin on the rook. And that's the best move. Unbelievable. King e7, rook f e1. Preparing to move and hit this. Like, I'm just completely under a lot of pressure. But knight b to d2. He plays knight d4, which just hangs that pawn. But that wasn't the best move. I was supposed to play knight takes d4 so that he couldn't take on c6. But after queen takes c5, knight 2 f3, not knight to f3, knight 2, knight, the knight on 2 to f3 hits my queen. And I have to go back. And then he can take the bishop and split my pawns and double my f pawns. And normally this is like not a bad transformation for black, but... These pawns are weak, and they're not really preventing anything from occupying that square. So this is just a liability. And also, queen takes d5 is just a free pawn, like I've said many times before. And if I try to kick it out with this, then I just lose yet another pawn. But yeah, queen takes d5, and now we're even on pawns. Because if you will remember, I was up a pawn previously, right? Because I took the one on e5. But now he's back even. And I play this, and this is just where things go from bad to worse. How can, audience moment, how can white check my king and attack that pawn at the same time? And if you're able to figure it out, the answer is this. Boom and boom. And after I block, bishop takes f4, hits the queen. I go here. This is another one of those situations where knight f6 was one of the best moves by the computer but it still says it was an inaccuracy this is like the only thing that i saw trading the queens and by the way if this queen was protected that would not be an option for me but that's just an equal value trade and i thought this bishop was a bit misplaced bishop to d3 i go here knight c5 attacking the bishop my next move is probably gonna be knight e6 and attack this bishop bishop b5 castles so I think I'm doing okay here, despite being down a pawn, and also just having lots of pressure along these files. I just, I think objectively, I should have realized that white was better, <laughs> but I didn't. I, I, there, attacks the bishop. Knight e6 gets in the way of the rook's attack on the bishop, and also, like, kind of quote-unquote attacks that bishop. Bishop back to g3, and then I go... This is just an indicator of how tired and shook up I was by the previous games and my the, my the, my day so far. Because I'm like, okay, I'm going to go f5 and go here because that traps the bishop. That was my thought process. But A, that just hangs the knight, which my opponent took. But also B, let's just say I got a pawn here. Bishop h4 doesn't, doesn't trap the bishop at all because the knight defends it. And actually, bishop takes c6, and then rook takes e6 is the better option, because rook takes bishop at the end of that. But yeah, neither one of the things I thought were true about that position was true about that position, and I end up just losing my knight. And I play on, because I realized this is my last game today, I play on by going here, and g5, which I thought trapped the bishop. 
But he can go here because, again, the knight guards the bishop. The knight guards the bishop, right? I'm just losing everything. Hold on. That was that was just my sister. Um, so I go here, right? Double attacking the bishops. This is like my last hope. My last possible hope to try to fight off. But there is a very devastating move that he plays. Bishop c4. And everything is guarded. And he's setting up uh, discovery threats on my king. And I just resign in this position. I, I just resign because I'm like, look, I'm not going to play this position where I'm down five points of material. And I have massive threats against my king. And that's, so that's it for the meat games. But we also have this fun game that I played against my uncle. Remember, like a while ago, I posted the video about teaching him how to play chess. So we had a bit of a weird game. We played over the board one day. And we have a couple cats at the house. And one of them was walking across the board while we were playing. And what ended up happening, I believe, or what I thought happened was that she moved this pawn back to d7, the cat did. So at one point, white got two moves in a row. So the opening is impossible to recreate on chess.com, uh, where legal moves are the only moves that you can play. So I had to go into like an editor and create this position from scratch. Because from this position, this is what happened, right? So yeah, white got two moves in a row at some point, right? So after this, I play knight f5 two, because like the pawn was on d7 before this, I play knight f5 to attack this square. He pushes the pawn to d6 to guard it by bishop and queen, right? So let's just go on from here. Castles, right? And then he plays g6, which is a really good move because I have to go back to g3. Or I could have gone to h6, which I just wasn't a fan of because I was like, why do this? But the reason why I do this is because you stop castling. And if knight back to g8, that undevelops the knight and traps the rook. So that's why I do that. But I go back to g3 because I didn't want to do that. Or maybe I didn't even see it. I don't know. h5, he's trying to attack my knight. But there was something incredibly sneaky in this position. <laughs> After h5, I go bishop to g5. Which is a, which isn't like, it's an interesting mistake. Because this, and if I take, and then like I do nothing, then queen to b6 at some, right? Or wait, no, the pawn was, okay. Yeah, then h4, knight h1, and bishop b6, and he just has a really strong position. But at some point, uh, this pawn is going to be pushed to f4, so he could check and make my king go to h1 and then play h4 so my knight doesn't have that retreat square. That's what I was trying to get at. But bishop to g5, obviously the goal is to play this. But he plays bishop to e7, which is perfectly fine if he didn't see this idea with bishop h6. Now I play f4, which could lead me into trouble because of queen to b6. And if I play here, then h4 just traps my knight. And I have to find knight h5. Knight takes here, and bishop takes. Bishop takes g5. f takes g5, takes, and then knight d5. That's what I have to find to even somewhat be in the game. So f4, he doesn't find queen b6. Instead, he goes here. Because he like, he knows that the bishop pair is good to have, so he's trying to get my bishop. But I go bishop to c4 because I'm just kind of pointing at this. Still, h h4 is always going to be good. But like <laughs> bishop g4 attacking my queen is good because there's very little things that can defend it. Like, like just look at this move, bishop g4. Right? Like I can't guard this because the well i could go bishop b2 but it's really uncomfortable because the knight also guards that square i can't push a pawn i can't block with my rook i really like if i try to move my queen out of the way then h4 is still a thing so it's just, this is just really uncomfortable for me like i completely underestimated this h4 move the entire game so i played bishop c4 then he goes knight to g4 because he's just trying to get all the pieces into the party and he's trying to threaten this fork on e3 but there is something better here there is something better, and that is 
because the knight jumps in, threatens the fork, and hits my bishop. So he thinks he's just going to win here because he's he's threatening a fork and threatening my bishop. But I can go here. And if he goes here, taking my queen, right, then I, ta then I take, he takes, and I take. And I would be up a piece at the end of this, right? I would be up a full piece and also a pawn if I decide to take here. Right, so knight g4, the best move, by the way, um, the computer is arguing about is bishop takes here, because after king takes, pawn takes opens up a check on that. That's why I played f4, because I was trying to open up the rook on that king. But this is another one of those circumstances where the best move is labeled as an inaccuracy by the computer. I really don't know why that happens. Like, it's really, really strange. Queen takes, and then I take take, by the way. If I jumped into d5 right now, this is a massive, massive blunder. Audience moment. What is a move that black can do to get out of the threat and create a checkmate threat on my king? And if you're able to figure out the answer is queen to h4. Getting out of the threat and attacking h2. And if I play h3, then he just takes my knight for free. So I just, I'm forced to give up a knight. So I saw that he could go here. So instead, I took first, opening up a double attack on that f7 pawn with a bishop and rook, very sneaky. He plays knight to e6 because in this game, I was helping him. I was like, he was thinking about a bunch of different moves. He was like, well, I could fork, I could play f6, I could play rook f8, I could castle. But I was at, at one point, I was just like, look at what I'm attacking. And he's like, okay, I guess the best move is this. But the best move, according to the computer, was bishop to e6, just getting in the way with the bishop. I didn't even see that move when we were playing. The knight e6, I take, anchored by my pawn. Knight e3, he now hops in, which is a big, big, big mistake because of a forced sequence of trades. Queen e7. King e7, knight d5. This hits the king and the knight, so he has to take... And then I take with the pawn attacking his knight. And look at how powerful these pawns become. He pretty much has to go back here. And then I check, right? You should, when you have two pawns like this, you should always be careful about how you move them up the board because of the squares that they weaken. But in this case, it's fine to move this up right away because the bishop guards this square. So the king has to go back. And then you can play rook takes f7, right? And just invade knight e8. I get the other rook into the party. B5, he said, he was like, said something like, I'm just delaying the inevitable here. B5, this attacks the bishop, but it does allow my bishop to go here, improve its position, and attack the rook. Rook goes there, and then I play this. Because I see that if with my knight on this square, I have two possible checks if this bishop were to be traded. Bishop f5. And I sacrifice. I just get rid of that bishop because that bishop is the most annoying piece. And if I can get the rook here and the knight here and here, that would be almost mate. Rook h7. And I have to make a couple of preparatory moves to try to checkmate this king, right? Knight to c5 just gets my knight in the optimal position. Then here, then I play knight e6 check, right? And if he comes down, then I have a fork. I just pick up the rook. He takes the free pawn. Then I go here, I'm trying to control all of his flight scores. So he can't go here or here or here. The only flight score he can go to is this. So, but if he plays this right now, then I have rook f7. And if he goes down, then I have rook e7. And I just take the knight or go d7. So I'm just trying to control as many squares as possible. Rook to c1, he checks me a bunch of times and then he just picks up a pawn so he could come back and maybe check me at some point, but rook f7. This takes away the last flight square that he had available. So now if I'm able to find a check, it would be mate. Here and here is checkmate in this position because I have successfully removed all of his flight scores. This is actually a very useful lesson, by the way. Like when you're up a bunch of pieces and you're trying to check the checkmate the king, I'm not very good at this, but this game I did it pretty well. Just look for all the way, before you even start looking for checks, just look at how you can try to restrict your opponent's king's mobility. Like, look at how you can restrict 
the squares that it can move to before you look for checks. And then when the king is fully restricted, you then move the, the pieces in for the killing blow like this. This is what I was doing. Rook takes a two, knight here, knight f8, and this is the killing blow. Like, he cannot stop this. This is unstoppable. He just delays it for as long as possible. Knight g7, which does stop it because it controls the square, but it gives up a knight for that price. King to e8 gets out of the way as well because now that's not a check, so I have to move back. He's he's being very resilient. I will give him that. Rook a4, I take the pawn, but then it's mate. So the lesson from that game that I will give him and the people, other people watching is when you are trying to check mate a king, first, before you look for checks, take away all of its flight squares. Then move the piece in for the killing blow. And if the king finds a way to sacrifice pieces to move, then just do the same thing, and you'll eventually win if you're up enough material. So with that, folks, I've been The Amazing Haley, and I will see you in the next video.